Picture this, it's 1999, Apple's back, baby. Steve Jobs has returned, the Matrix is blowing minds in theaters, and the internet still makes noises. But nestled among the candy-colored iMacs and futuristic iBooks is something darker, sleeker, and, according to the US government, potentially deadly. I'm talking about a computer so powerful it was literally classified as a weapon. No, not metaphorically, legally. The Power Macintosh G4. Let's clear this up real quick. In the late 90s, US export law had a rule that any computer capable of more than a gigaflop, that's one billion floating point operations per second, was considered too powerful to sell to certain countries. Why? Because those kind of calculations weren't just for Photoshop. They were useful in missile guidance systems, cryptography, nuclear simulations, you know, your typical after-school hobbies. So, when Apple unveiled the G4 and it clocked in over that threshold, it was immediately flagged. The US Department of Commerce said, whoa there, Apple, you can't just ship this thing off to China, Iraq, or Russia like it's a beige box full of spreadsheets. That made the G4 the first consumer computer to be classified as a munition. And Apple, oh, they ran with it. Apple has never met a dramatic moment it didn't love. The ads, straight out of a Cold War thriller. One showed the G4 wrapped in yellow crime scene, do not cross tape. Another boldly claimed the first personal computer classified as a weapon. Even Steve Jobs leaned into it during the keynote. You could practically hear the Mission Impossible theme playing behind him as he demoed Final Cut Pro on a machine the government considered military grade. And the design? Please. That smoked graphite case, the swooping translucent handles, it looked like HAL 9000 went clubbing in Berlin and came back sexy and dangerous. It didn't just look powerful, it was. So what gave the G4 its firepower? The answer? The PowerPC 7400 chip, built with something Apple called the Velocity Engine. This was a vector processing unit based on Motorola's AltaVec architecture, basically SIMD, Single Instruction Multiple Data. Which, I know, sounds like your ex trying to explain crypto, but here's what it means. The G4 could process massive chunks of data, video, audio, scientific simulations, faster and more efficiently than anything else in its price range. Even the base model at 400 megahertz could outperform Pentium 3's in floating point heavy tasks. The higher end 450 megahertz and dual 500 megahertz setups, those were workstation killers. Real-time photo rendering, check. Photoshop filters applied like butter, double check. Secretly calculating missile trajectories behind the scenes, allegedly. Now, remember, this wasn't happening in a vacuum. In 1999, Windows 98 was still king, and Intel's Pentium 3 had just launched. But the P3 was facing backlash over its creepy built-in serial ID. Meanwhile, most PC towers were beige rectangles, and performance? Inconsistent at best. Creative Pros had two options. Drop $10,000 plus on an SGI workstation, or build a DIY PC and pray your drivers were stable. Then Apple shows up with a gorgeous tower running Mac OS 9 with real Unix style muscle under the hood. It became the machine for video editors, graphic designers, audio engineers, and yes, nerdy academics doing very serious calculations. The G4 made Apple relevant again, not just stylish, but powerful. Let's dig into the red tape. At the time, the US was still regulating computer exports during Cold War era rules designed for supercomputers. The logic was, don't let countries we don't like get their hands on anything they could use for WMDs. And to be fair, back in the day, supercomputers were rare. But by 1999, Moore's law had made that logic hilariously outdated. Suddenly, you could buy a gigaflop off the shelf at Comp USA. Apple's G4 just happened to be the first consumer machine to trip the wire. Lobbyists pushed back. Tech companies begged for updated rules. 
And by 2000, the Clinton administration finally raised the gigaflop threshold, ending the G4's brief career as a forbidden fruit. But for that glorious window of time, it was the Mac that couldn't leave the country. The G4 had staying power. It evolved through multiple iterations, gigabit ethernet, quicksilver, mirror drive doors, you name it. But perhaps its weirdest offspring, the G4 Cube. Released in 2000, it was Apple's attempt to bottle G4 power in a silent, fanless, artsy little box. It was cool, it was sleek, it was $17.99, and it flopped hard. Still, people love the G4 lineage. It powered everything from professional studios to university labs. It laid the groundwork for the G5, and eventually Apple's transition to Intel. And now it's a collector's dream, especially if you have one that still boots, and you know I do. So next time someone brags about their sick gaming rig, just ask, cool, but was it ever banned from international export by the Department of Commerce? Because the Power Mac G4 wasn't just a milestone. It wasn't just stylish. It was literally too powerful for the world to handle. Dangerous curves, a big old velocity engine, and a flair for government controversy? Same, honestly. Thanks for hanging out with me and this absolute smoke show of a tower. Hit that like button if you're into beautiful gigaflops, and don't forget to subscribe for more retro tech that'll melt your heart. I've had a couple people ask me about sending me some hardware. Let me know if this is something you still might be interested in and I can look into setting up a P.O. box. After all, one man's trash is another tech girl's treasure. Before we wrap up, just want to take a moment to thank my Patreon subscribers. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Until next time, tech lovers, stay curious and remember, it's not just retro, it's a weapon of mass nostalgia.